Well, I am quite pleased to uh, introduce someone tonight who deserves accolades and farm animals and anything his heart desires because he is a bright and shining beacon. He is an author. He is a, uh, I see that his table is celebrating the uh, ideals of husbandry. Perhaps you know his work, The Red Queen, Genome, or something that has become required reading in the Independence Den of Horror, and that is The Rational Optimist. Because if you are a libertarian, if you consider someone to whom freedom is the ultimate human ideal, then you are, by definition, by nature, a rational optimist. And that is a beautiful thing. And uh, to build upon some of the ideas that have been shared with you tonight, Matt Ridley is, he is going to blow your skirt up, and not just you, Lawson. <laughs> Perhaps you engaged in his TED Talk, When Ideas Have Sex, and I have to tell you that if evolutionary biology, economics, and journalism all had sex, not only would it be an intriguing thruple, which if it hasn't already been added to the dictionary, it totally should be. That should be the 2014 word of the year, thruple. They would have a baby, and his name would be the one and only, the incomparable, the silver-penned Matt Ridley. Give it up. I'm not going to dance, I promise. <laughs> or maybe a bit. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's a fantastic honor to be here. It's, it's incredible to see what's happened to CEI in the years since it was born in the mid-80s. And it's a bit of a trip down memory lane for me, too, because tw uh, 27 years ago, my office was in this very block right over in that far corner when I was working for The Economist. And I met CEI, which I thought was an old and venerable think tank that had been around for 85 years or something like that. And they played a huge part in my education. So the first thing I want to do tonight is to recognize the role that Fred Smith played in my life in uh, introducing me to... to the idea that government doesn't always deserve the credit for what it claims and that people are the solution and not the problem. I'd also like to recognize Ian Murray uh, of CEI because, well, a couple of reasons. First of all, he's not only a Brit, he's a Tynesider, he's a Geordie. He's from Newcastle on Tyne, which is where I'm from. And he's a, he's a proud alumnus of the school which my son attended and which my wife is a governor of. Uh, Ian continues to teach me invaluable things about British politics, even though he's 4,000 miles away. I'd also like to... Uh, there are a lot of old friends in this audience, and I could just go on naming them, but uh, I would like particularly to mention Joe Kwong uh, of the Philanthropy Roundtable. I don't know where Joe is. Because nearly 30 years ago, Joe opened my eyes to the idea that free markets, not command and control, are the answer for environmental problems. Uh, I read a large article about this, and she was hugely important in introducing me to the whole idea of free market environmentalism. It's impossible not to comment on the wonderfulness of Jerry Ostrom uh, in, a, in a group like this, because... Jerry has been the generous host, godfather, people mixer, and counterintuitive serendipity generator. Those are his two favorite words for many, many great ideas for people like me. And of course, John Tierney, the great John Tierney. I first noticed John's work when he wrote that famous Recycling is Garbage article, the one which 
as Jerry mentioned, generated more hate mail than any in the New York Times history. And his superb reporting has been a joy to read ever since, as have his books and all his other commentary. Back in the 1990s, I wasn't yet a contrarian on environmental issues, though I'd started down that road I'd, to follow in John's footsteps. It takes a lot of courage to challenge any conventional wisdom, but especially on planetary pessimism. Just saying that you think the world may not be going to hell in a handbasket is treason these days. And it makes people very, very cross for some reason. Good news is no news. And as my friend and colleague in the House of Lords, Nigel Lawson, wrote recently, I've never shied away from controversy, nor, for example, as Chancellor, worried about being unpopular if I believed what I was saying and doing was in the public interest. But I have never in my life experienced the extremes of personal hostility, vituperation, and vilification which I, along with other dissenters, have received for my views on global warming and global warming politics. It's lonely being right about climate change these days. <laughs> And the bizarre thing is, the longer the pause in global warming goes on, the greater the gap between prediction and reality, the lonelier it gets. Because scientists are getting ever more cautious about departing from the catechism. The bullies are winning in academia. You can be excommunicated if you tell the truth. I talk to scientists all the time who are certain that climate change is not the greatest threat to mankind or the planet, but they won't say so for fear of the Inquisition. They're very happy that journalists like John Tierney and myself are out there taking the flak, but they won't man the barricades alongside us. Take the case of Leonard Bengtsson. He's about as distinguished as climatologists get, former director of uh, Max Planck Institute of Meteorology. Yet after he joined the board of the, the advisory board of the Global Warming Policy Foundation, uh, and said that he thought exaggerated claims of likely harm from climate change were a mistake, he was vilified in the most extraordinary terms and, and had to resign for the sake of his health and his sanity. And he received this email from an executive of a British wind farm developer. You've let your ego get out of control and you now risk putting lives at risk all over the world. You should know better. Grow up, for God's sake, man. I have no sympathy for the unbearable pressure you are suffering from. It's entirely self-inflicted, and I hope it gives you proper reflection on what a complete and utter childish moron you are. It's from a business executive to a scientist. The reason they get so angry, of course, about this is because they know that if they lose this battle, they'll lose the war. This is their Stalingrad, and they're fighting for every street. For me, this has all been a bit of a rude awakening, because I've defended science all of my career. I carried a lot of water for scientists in many debates with their critics on topics like cloning, genetically modified food, evolution, and so on. And I did so because I'm passionate about science. And by science, I mean discovering the truth without fear or favor wherever it leads. Richard Feynman said, science is the belief in the ignorance of experts. <laughs> but it turns out that's not what science is. Science is, and I hear a quote from a recent essay by Jerome Rabbits, a guru of postmodern science, Science is a product of social construction, of negotiation among interests, or merely relative to a professional consensus. Science now means the political priorities of scientists. The National Academy and the Royal Society no longer behave like clubs of people seeking to roll back ignorance. They're trade unions who see their job as boosting the finance of science and telling politicians what decisions they should be taking. The Royal Society re recently made Paul Ehrlich, an honorary fellow. And I see this all the time in Parliament. I, I, just to explain, I somehow got myself into the House of Lords uh, l last year, uh, which uh, is a pretty weird thing to do. 
I'm, quite well, I'm well below the average age, which is very exciting for me. And um, just to give you a glimpse of the kind of thing that goes on, I, soon after I joined it, this, an old bloke shuffled up to me and he said, um, I, knew your, uh, I know your uncle, the, the, the politician Nicholas Ridley. So I said, oh, well, that's great. How wonderful. It's a pity, you know, that he's dead. And uh, dead? He's not dead. And I said, well, he died 21 years ago. Um, I don't think so, he said. <laughs> so he then said, now who's Matt Ridley? So I said, well, that's me. He said, no, 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 I, I, I know that's your name, but there's a writer chappy with that name. <laughs> so I said, that's me. And he said, I don't think so. <laughs> and walked off. Speaking of Parliament, I knew before I was elected to the Lords that uh, national parliaments are full of pork barrel mongers acting on behalf of special interests. I learnt that not from my years in education, of course, but from people like Fred Smith and Ian Murray and Greg Conco. Turns out they misled me. The problem is not widespread. It's rampant. It's not a dirty secret. It's an open secret. It's far worse than I thought. One day I stood up in the Chamber of the House of Lords and, and criticised the subsidies we were proposing to give to wind farm developers to try and solve the climate problem. Whereupon a colleague from my own party, a very distinguished chap, stood up and said, no, 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 I was wrong. Because he had had a meeting that very morning with executives from a wind farm company and they had told him that the subsidies we were offering were not high enough. <laughs> so he thought we should raise them, just like that. It's that easy to buy politicians. They have far more affection, politicians, for industries that ask them for money than for ones that don't. Strange, that. Fossil fuels are the devil incarnate. Wind companies with the begging bowl out are treated like honored guests. Anyway, as John and I and Julian Simon and Bjorn Lomborg and others have discovered, once you start challenging received wisdom, not only do you lose half your friends, but it becomes a bit of a habit. John Tierney once said, just because an idea appeals to a lot of people doesn't mean it's wrong, but that's a good working theory. <laughs> so I want to give you a few counterintuitive truths. I, I, I've just, I, I flew in this morning from Canada, and I've been on a bit of a lecture tour trying to T sell some counterintuitive truths in Canada. Um, and Canada has got a pretty sensible government, federal government at the moment, um, as has Australia. And I think it's quite exciting that um, Tony Abbott and, and uh, um, what's the Canadian chap called, um, are getting together and, and comparing notes. By the way, do you remember how you tell the difference between a Canadian and an Australian? You ask, you ask them, have you ever made love to a 14-year-old? <laughs> if they're Canadian, they will reply, certainly not, never dream of such a thing. How dare you ask such a question? If they're Australian, they reply, 14-year-old what? I probably ought to leave now. <laughs> um, anyway, the five contrarian myths that I've been trying to sell to the Canadians this week are firstly that the world is getting greener because of fossil fuels, not despite them. And I mean this quite literally. Satellites show a 14% increase over the last 30 years in the amount of green vegetation on this planet. And, and the teams that are analyzing it are picking up very good persuasive evidence that this is because of the extra carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which makes plants grow faster, particularly in dry regions, 
But do you know what? It's showing up in the Amazon, too. The amount of green vegetation in the Amazon is more than it was 30 years ago when CEI was formed. Well done, Fred and others. The second counterintuitive point I like to sell is that we've passed peak farmland. We'll need less and less farmland from now on to feed the world. We need 65% less farmland to produce the same amount of food as we did 50 years ago. That's averaged across all crops. It's a calculation by Jesse Orzabel of Rockefeller University. And there's no let up in that rate of improvement. Indeed, if Africa starts to raise its yields, as it hardly has done yet, it won't even require more innovation. It'll just require getting fertilizer to, to farmers who need it. And if you assume generous population growth, generous GDP growth, and much more meat eating in, in, in what is now the poor world, you still cannot get the numbers to show that you're going to need more and more farmland. You're going to need less and less. Or rather, you would need less and less were it not for biofuels. <laughs> We're turning 5% of the world's grain crop into motor fuel. That displaces 0.6% of the world's oil use. So it's having a trivial impact on our use of oil, but it's having a huge impact on food prices. And that's tipping probably 200,000 people a year into malnutrition and even death, according to calculations by Indra Goklani. The third counterintuitive truth is that the richest countries are the ones with the most recovery in wildlife, biodiversity, and forest cover showing that growth is good for the environment. Every rich country on Earth is currently reforesting. But so are countries like Bangladesh and Vietnam. Forest cover is increasing in virtually every country with a GDP per capita above $4,600 a year. Wildlife is booming in Europe and North America, but it's not booming in other places. I was in Vancouver two days ago, and I went for an early morning walk in Stanley Park. And as I came out of the park, there's an underpass under a busy freeway and cyclists going through this underpass. And through the underpass, weaving between the cyclists, go two otters <laughs> going from one pond to another in the middle of the city. And the cyclists obviously saw them all the time. They weren't even amazed by this. And I thought for a moment and I thought, you Canadians spent the last 300 years skinning things like that. <laughs> And now you just happily live alongside them. That's what economic growth can do. <laughs> the fourth counterintuitive truth is, of course, that the more we save the lives of babies, the slower the population of the world will grow. Population growth rate has halved in my lifetime. We're adding fewer and fewer people to the, to the popula world population and have been for 20 years. And that's because... We're, we're improving the lives of the poor, not because we're making life tough for them. It's an, a counterintuitive and brilliant idea. But fifth, the solution to global warming is to grow the world economy as fast as possible, develop new technologies, and expand trade. And here's my dirty little secret. That proposition is not contrarian. It's what the expert consensus actually says. It's just that a bunch of self-appointed green gurus have persuaded the world's media that degrowth is greener than growth, poverty than wealth. In the words of the courageous Canadian journalist Donna Laframboise, a bunch of well-fed, overprivileged, first world activists and journalists have convinced an entire generation of politicians that fossil fuels are evil. What we need, they say, is an ordered and structured downsizing of the global economy, in the words of George Monbiot. What we need is to scale back overconsumption, says Naomi Klein. What we need is localized production, and we need to cut the energy use of Americans to below the per capita level of Bangladesh, says Bill McKibben. We need a massive campaign to de-develop the United States, those are the words of Paul Ehrlich and John Holdren, the government's chief scientific advisor in this country now, in a book they published 40 years ago. 
In other words, the Greens keep saying it's vital that we sacrifice economic growth to save the planet. But they're the ones who are flying in the face of their own favorite United Nations report, the IPCC Fifth Assessment Report. Because if you go and look up what the IPCC actually says, it has two scenarios, among others, called RCP 2.6 and RCP 8.5, and one shows no global warming after 2030, even with extremely high climate sensitivity. The, either, the other shows dangerous climate change by the end of this century. One shows huge prosperity, with GDP per capita approaching 16 times today's global average, when people will be earning $175,000 a year in today's money as a result of an expansion of world trade and acceleration of innovation and the deregulation of markets. The other shows just a trebling of income with stagnant trade, national self-sufficiency, exploding population, and a break on innovation. Which is which? The one with rapid growth is the one where climate change ceases to be a problem in their own models. The poor and miserable one is the one where climate change becomes dangerous. In other words, even the IPCC says that trade, innovation, and freedom are the answer, not the problem, and that self-sufficiency regulation and the stifling of innovation are the problem and not the answer. Why does nobody know this? Why are President Obama and Ban Ki-moon not saying this? Incidentally, the IPCC scenario that produces dangerous climate change, the RCP 8.51, the only one that produces dangerous climate change by 2100, by the way, assumes we will be burning 10 times as much coal as today and producing 50% of the world's primary energy from coal. Now, that'd be great news for me because I come from Newcastle and <laughs> that's where coal comes from. But even that scenario, but it's extremely unlikely that that will be the situation. And even that scenario cannot generate dangerous climate change if you use a realistic estimate of climate sensitivity. Remember that Al Gore said in 2006, many scientists are now warning that we are moving closer to several tipping points that could, within 10 years, make it impossible for us to avoid irretrievable damage to the planet's habitability for human civilization. 18 months to go, Al. <laughs> and we're getting greener every year. So why does the madness continue? Well, it's no great mystery. Environmental exaggeration generates $300 million a year for Greenpeace. Unlike a real multinational, Greenpeace can get away with doing as much as it can to block a technology, golden rice, that could prevent the deaths and blindness of half a million people a year. They shamelessly campaign against this humanitarian technology, and if a multinational did that, it would be laughed out of court. And if there was any lingering doubt that Greenpeace is a vast multinational company motivated mainly by money, it was dispelled last week when it emerged that a rogue trader in Greenpeace International's currency trading division lost $5.2 million betting against the euro. <laughs> they took a charitable donation and gambled with it in the foreign exchange market, and then came out with some feeble apology about a rogue trader. That's what we're up against. Ladies and gentlemen, we live in incredible times. The world as a whole is getting rapidly Wealthier, healthier, happier, cleverer, kinder, freer, cleaner, safer, more peaceful, and yes, more equal. The income is going up. People in poor countries are getting rich faster than people in rich countries are getting rich. So inequality is on the way down. Yet those forces, the forces that caused that improvement are being vilified and castigated. John Stuart Mill once wrote, it is not the man who hopes when others despair, but the man who despairs when others hope, who is regarded by a large class of persons as a sage. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>